I don't know. And so I like getting those prayer team praying for us, don't you? So uh, take advantage of the opportunity. But we're going to stand together, find somebody's hand, shake their hand, and say, Arkansas is going to win. Okay? Come on, let's stand together. <laughs> <laughs>
was staying in this corner or something because we're missing about 20 people here in the middle. They sent an email. You know, uh,
I always want to do that because I want the back row to have the experience of being in front row sometimes. And so, uh, and so this morning we're going to start out down here before I get behind the pulpit. But if you have your Bibles with you, turn to Joshua chapter 7. I always love the name Joshua. I don't know why, I just like it. Joshua chapter 7. And the way that we're going to be constructing what we're going to learn from and what we're going to teach from today is that we're going to tell the story that's in John chapter 7 and then we're going to apply it in, in a few ways. And it's, this is serious stuff. Joshua chapter 7. Now, before we read it, just kind of put it down and let me just talk for a minute. I don't know, this is one of the greatest understatements that I've ever made. Things have changed over the last 30 years. Uh, it, it's just incredible at the breakneck speed that we are changing. Right. And uh, a culture as well as church, we're changing. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip the culture because that just gets me too upset. I'm going to worry about that a little bit later today. But let's just talk about the church. What's happened to the church just over the last 30, 40 years? We've been through and, and are still going through with many people. I call them the worship wars because we couldn't sing certain songs anymore because they're not spiritual enough. And then we sing 7-Eleven choruses where we repeat so many words and we just kind of keep doing it until you rev up the audience. We've gone and gotten rid of choirs and we go to praise bands. And, and all, I'm not saying anything is bad. I'm just telling you the change that's occurring. It's fundamental to who we are. And most of the larger churches in Little Rock and around the country, when you go to church today, pastor will not have time, more likely wearing blue jeans. Most of them wear blue jeans and some kind of fancy shoe or boots. If it's up to me, I'd be wearing boots, but that's another story, okay? But that's what they'll be doing. And you can wear shorts, doesn't it? I'm talking three or 4,000 people, and you can come in with shorts, and you can sit down with your cup of coffee, and you're going to have church. And that's the way the experience is going to be. They've gotten rid of small groups. They've gotten rid of various... It's just a dynamic that has changed. And this area is like every other area. Uh, uh, in, in Bryant, where I spent most of my pastoral work, uh, there's a church in every strip mall now. Uh, in Maumelle, where we're living, where we're moving from the endless move that we're experiencing, by the way. Uh, when we come from all over, there's churches in every strip mall. There are a variety of denominations. The main, the main change right now, nobody wants to be affiliated with anybody. We want to be free and pastor-led and all that kind of stuff. I can talk about all this all you want. But times have changed. And because of that, the message is changing. And when the message changes, we're in trouble. Right. Because we cannot preach about nothing. We can't do 13 weeks how to make the best cup of coffee to stimulate conversation and call that church anymore. Amen. And we also cannot allow ourselves to be so guided by our culture that we never say anything that will offend anybody at any time. So for the next three weeks as we build toward Easter, and Easter is the holiest day of the Christian calendar, you, if you can't go to church on Easter, you can't go to church, period. Right. You've got to come. And it's because it is the day for us. We're going to build from that. And we're going to build starting with something. In the message today in Joshua. A message that we need to remind ourselves from. Because and I think you will see the important part of it. Now I want to use a word right now. That on Facebook one day will be banished. And we can't say it. Many churches won't say it. A lot of TV preachers won't say it. They're scared. Are you ready? The word is sin. We can no longer use that word in a lot of places because we're not supposed to offend people. Well, let me offend you big time. You're a sinner. That's right. I am too. But I'm a forgiven sinner. Amen. And I hope you are too. And that kind of changes things. Let's look in Joshua chapter 7. Powerful statement, powerful thing. And I'm already on 1 Kings. So let me turn back to Joshua chapter 7. Reading out New International today. <clears throat> Starting with verse 2. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai. Ai is one of those really cool Hebrew words. Do you know how you say that in the Hebrew? Ai. <laughs> yeah, that was funny. 
which is near Bethlehem on the east of Bethel, and he told them, go out and spy the region. So they went out and went out and they spied out Ai. Now notice their attitude in verse 3. When they returned to Joshua, they said, don't let all the people go up there. They don't, we don't need everybody. Send two or three thousand men to take it, and do not weary all the people. Don't bother everybody, for only a few men are there. So about three thousand men went up, and did you notice in verse 4? They were routed by the men of Ai, who chased and killed 36 of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as from the stone quarries, struck them down on the slopes, and the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Just to now keep it open, I'm going to continue to read. But the historical context, this, this is right after they took Jericho. It's like a mighty army came in and took Little Rock, and they came up on their way to Hot Springs, and Owensville is in the middle. That's the kind of experience this is. And you saw their attitude, oh, it doesn't matter how many people go up, oh, just two or three thousand men. It doesn't make any difference at all, because they're going to run. There's not very many of them there. And so if you can take those big cities like Jericho, then, then Ai was just nothing but a bump on the log. But then, of course, the people proved that there are Baptists in the Old Testament. Did you catch it on the last part of that verse? When something bad happened to them, the hearts of the people melted. And we came like water. That was really good. Humor. And then Joshua proved that he had Baptist tendencies too. Look at verse 6. And he tore his clothes and he fell face down to the ground. He stuck his nose down in the dirt before the ark of the Lord. He stayed there till the evening. The elders of Israel, the same, sprinkled dust on their heads. And then notice verse 7. Joshua said, I, Sodom, Lord, why did you ever bring this people across Jordan to deliver us to the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side of Jordan. Does that sound familiar? Joshua was one of the spies that went over there and said, let's go take the land because God gave it to us. Remember, this is not just somebody that has no faith. This is somebody that's got glorious faith. And he loves the Lord. He loves Jehovah. He does all that. And he finds himself acting like those people that we all preach about that lost their faith when something bad happened. Why didn't we just stay over there? What can I say, Lord, now that we've been routed, they're going to hear? What then will we do for your name? Now look at verse 10. The Lord said to Joshua, Stand up, get the up. What are you doing down on your face? I think that's a southern vernacular translation. God said, Boy, what are you doing on your face? Get up. Get your face out of the dirt. Verse 11 Israel has sinned, and they violated my covenant. He commanded them to take it. They took some of the things. They lied. They put it in their own possessions. And that's why now, now uh, if you underline any scripture in all the Bible, and you want to talk about America, you want to talk about the future, you want to talk about any country in the world, notice verse 12. Notice verse 12. This is why Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. And they turn their backs and they run because they've been lied, they lied to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever is among you is devoted to them. God said, you don't take care of this, I will not be with you. Now I will give you a preview of what we're going to talk about a little bit later. But if America does not stand with God and do and follow God's commandments, God has not promised that he will be with us. Right. Yeah. He has no covenant. That says, I'm going to be with you just because you're America and you're the good guys and you wear a white hat. Right. And that's a message you're not going to hear in so many churches today because it dis disturbs the people or they think it's political or they think it's some other thing. But God said, I'm not going to be with you unless you take care of it. Now, God loved him because God said, listen, this is the reason you fail. You sin." And if you don't take care of this, I'm not going to be with you anymore. And then he said, this is how you take care of it. Now, how does he tell us? Jesus died for us. And we get to read that wonderful verse, 1 John 1, 9. That says, if you will confess your sins, God will forgive them. That's a glorious verse. 
So people say, I'm so burdened by my sin. Well, unburden yourself. God said that he'll forgive you. He'll forgive you. So, let's get to verse 13. Go consecrate the people. Tell them to consecrate yourselves. Prepare yourselves for worship. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. That is the, which is devoted among you. You can't stand until your enemies do remove it. So, verse 14. In the morning, present yourselves tribe by tribe. And so he, what he's doing, if I can paint the picture here, he's bringing all the 12 tribes of Israel. Each tribe will come by and walk by, and then they will point the guilty tribe. Now think about that if you're the guilty party. You're in a probably over a million people here. How in the world is anybody going to know it was you? But God said to do that. You bring them by, by the tribe, and then you're going to bring them by family. And then you're going to all of this by, and then God will deal with it. So, verse 16, early in the morning, Joshua did what he was told. And he came forward by tribes, and Judah was taken. Verse 17, the clans of Judah came forward, and he took the Zerites. And he had the clan of the Zerites come forward by the families, and the family of Zimri was taken. Verse 18, Joshua had his family come by man by man. And then we know the story, if you've been to Bible school or Sunday school, Achan, the son of Karma, the son of Zimra, the son of Zerah, though the tribe of Judah, was taken. He was caught. He sinned, and he was caught. And then he went, Joshua said, verse 19, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel. Give him praise. Tell me what you've done, and don't hide it from me. How could he? He'd been picked out of that mass of people Everybody's watching. He's looking. All of these things. And then Achan confesses. Verse 20. It's true. I've sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. And this is what I've done. I saw the plunder of beautiful robe from Babylon. 200 shekels of silver. A wedge of goat weighing 50 shekels. I coveted them as first sin. And took them. And they're hidden in the ground. Inside my tent. And the silver underneath. Joshua sent the messengers over and told them all to, to go get the stuff. So they brought back the gold and the silver. brought back the clothing that he stole, that Babylonian garment. And then verse 24, Joshua together with all of Israel took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, the gold wedge, his sons, his daughters, his cattle, his donkey, his sheep, his tent, and everything that he had, anything associated with Achan, he took to the valley of Achor. Why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord's going to bring you trouble this day. And then all of Israel stoned him. And after they stoned the rest, they burned him. And after they heaped a big pile of rocks, which remain to this day, and the Lord turned from his anger, the place has become the valley of Achor ever since. This is a powerful story. It's a covenant with God that we make, a covenant with God that they had. They broke the covenant, and it affected him. A whole bunch of folks. Okay, that's introduction. Now I'm going to walk up here and we're going to preach a little bit, okay? Amen. And uh, beginning with the first thing that I want you to see, unconfessed sin affects you individually. Unconfessed sin affects you individually. Individually. What do you mean, Brother Jim? Well, it's going to affect your life. If you have sin in your life, you don't take care of the sin in your life. It's going to affect your existence. I can't find my notes, so I'm just going to roll. It affects you. Right. It affects your walk. It affects your prayer life. It affects your character. It affects who you are. It affects your relationship with God. You might say, well, I don't feel like my prayers get off and get past the sin. Well, they might not. Don't you see? Right. This kind of unconfessed sin in your life... And God is going to say, you've got to take care of this, and you've got to take care of it now, and you take care of it, and then it's forgiven, and then you move on, and you don't worry about it. It affects you individually. I wonder how many people are sick. Do you know a passage in the New Testament we will look at on Easter Sunday? It even goes to, so far to say that some people have died because they've taken of this Lord's Supper communion unworthily. So we'll spend a lot of time that morning making sure that we're worthy to take it, you see. And so, and some are sick as well. I wonder how many of us have a disease because of sin in our life. Boy, that's old-fashioned preaching. 
Yeah. Well, it's old-fashioned truth. Amen. So it's okay. It affects you individually. What else does it do? It affects you individually. It affects your family. What happened to Achan's family? Did you notice? Do I need to remind you of that? He said he took all of the stuff that he had stolen. His sons, his daughters, his cattle, his donkeys, his sheep. His and he took everything that they had. Did his wife commit this crime? No. Did he have more than one wife? We don't know that. Let's say he did. He had a bunch of them. And they all got there with him. His sons and his daughter, did they commit the crime? No. He did. He did. By the way, have you ever thought about just really how dumb sin is? If it wasn't fun, nobody would be tempted. You know, I get tempted if somebody offers me butter pecan ice cream. That's going to go. That, that's temptation. <laughs> You put a boiled okra in front of me, I can resist that all day. Amen. That's easy. That's easy. And so what did he do? What was his great sin anyway? That caused his whole family to die. Well, they were taking over Jericho. God said, don't take anything at all. Don't look at that. Don't do it. And all that. And he saw a garment. He saw some clothes that he did not have. And they must have looked good. And having a garment from Babylon in those days is like having a right label on your blue jeans. It tells everybody you're willing to spend $400 for a pair of blue jeans. <laughs> they do just the same thing as the cheap blue jeans do. But anyway, he had to have that. And, uh, uh, and what was his big thrill? He got to put it in a jar probably or something and bury it under his tent because he couldn't wear it anywhere. Because if he wore it someplace, everybody would know where he got it, and then all of a sudden everybody would know his sin he'd have a problem. Well, Jimmy stole money. Yes, he did. He stole some silver and gold. And it's even measured out in Scripture. He stole money he could never spend. So the man, that's what sin does for you. It promises everything, but delivers nothing. And that's what it did. It was delivered to him that way. Was, uh, he got clothes he couldn't wear. He got money he could not ever spend. And all he could do is sit there and say, boy, I wish everybody knew what I had. Yeah. I wish they knew what I had. And they don't say the right thing or do the right thing. They know what's going to happen. All of us know people who family members that, that uh, consume with drug or alcohol abuse. And we know what happens to that family. You know, admit it. You know what happens to it. Right. And we can continue on about that husband and the problems that he had and things that he does and how it impacts him. And we don't understand so much. The New Testament even says, dads, don't exasperate your children. Don't cause them to anger. Don't put bitterness inside of them. Time and time again, let me tell you, when somebody inside that household is dominated by sin, it affects that whole family. And that's what the scripture's talking about here. And that's why all of them had to pay the price. They were infected by this guy. Because you know this is not the first time he's ever done something like this. You see, it affects him individually. It cost him his life. It affects his family. And it costs them their life as well. Now let me tell you, it affects the nation as well. It affects the nation as well. My heart is broken over my country. Right. I, I do let dearly love this place. I do. But you know, uh, what was the bumper sticker on that song? I thought it was just perfect. American by birth, Southerner by the grace of God. I just like that. I just like that. And so we have our find ourselves in the situation where we're living in an immoral land. Everywhere we go. I still, uh, 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 as you know, they're working for the Billy Graham organization. I really like to quote him once in a while. And I still remember something he said probably 50 years ago. He said, I'm shocked that I'm not shocked. I'm shocked that I'm not shocked. The language that we consume in entertainment. This is old stuff. And then they tell us those things don't affect us. We should turn them off. I don't know how much they're paying for uh, uh, the commercial time for the basketball tournament. 
I don't even know how much they paid for it for uh, the Super Bowl, the most viewed event on TV. For every 30 seconds, it's probably two or three million dollars. Now, if you were the number one salesman in the company and you went to Mr. Burger joint and he said, hey, listen, we want you to advertise for $4 million for 30 second commercial on a television show called the Super Bowl. And if you do that, and then uh, everybody's going to look at that and see your product and nobody will come into your store. You're not going to win the award. You're not going to say when they see your product, they're going to be repulsed by it and all that. Television makes its living influencing us on what we buy. Right. How in the name of Jehovah and all that is holy can a company stand up and say that a repetitive commercial 10 to 15 seconds radio, television, all that will not influence enough, will not influence us? It does. And so when, when we hear words like that and we see not only language, but we see attitudes. I like old movies. I like to watch, I mean, really old stuff. Sometimes they're just really funny. But uh, I really like the really, really old ones when the man and the woman, the two characters, had to kiss. And they, they, they would turn away from the camera or the cowboy hat would hide it because they didn't want to offend anybody. Now, when they smooch, it's like they're trying to get a tonsillectomy from each other. <laughs> it's one of the most interesting experiences at all. And it's influencing us. I'm trying to show you just how practical this stuff is. So when it starts to tell us what to wear, when it starts to tell us what to say, when it starts to tell us what to think, and that's exactly where we are. Right. The control is trying to tell us not only what we think, what we say, how we respond, and all those kind of things, and we can stand before God in a pulpit, in any storefront, or any church building, all across the country, can stand up and say that our culture is okay, we're going to survive and all that kind of stuff. No, we are not. That's right. There's no promise in Scripture that we will. I, 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 if God does not come back, uh, what kind of world will my grandchildren have? Right. What kind of world will they experience? What kind of world will their children experience? I tell you, it concerns me. Because the change before us is enormous. And the pulpits willing to preach the truth are getting fewer and fewer and fewer. That's right. Because we will sell our soul out for a crowd. Because that's how a lot of preachers are. Whatever we can do to draw a crowd, and then we hope the love of God will ooze into them some way. That's right. This will help. I still remember a commercial, uh, commercial. I still remember a person I was visiting with, and uh, in my hospice work last year, sometime I couldn't tell you exactly when it was, but I remember the conversation. We were just talking, and part of my job was to talk spiritual things. I'm not to offend anybody, and I would never offend anybody on purpose. And that but we just got to talking. And he said, "You know, Jim, I'm really involved in my faith, and my faith has really grown." I said, well, "Really, tell me about it." He said, now I understand that there is no hell. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah? Yeah, God would do God would do And I want you to know, Jim, it brings me great comfort to know that there is no hell. There is no punishment. That God is purely love, and that's just it. It concerns me. Sister Sue and I were talking before... Uh, 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 church today, we're talking about seminaries. They're, they're, they're teaching something different. They're telling us about the sharing our faith is different. We've got to tell people about Jesus. Amen. We've got to tell people that Jesus died for our sin and that we're a sinner. And the way that you get right with God and the way that you build that bridge with God is to build a relationship with Him. You ask Jesus into your heart. Amen. You ask Him into your heart. Well, that's offensive to people. So, it's going to offend some. It's going to offend some. I will tell you, when I really got caught, and I know that I offended somebody, 
I had a wonderful privilege to speak to 800 Muslims in Arkansas. It's a fascinating experience, I'll tell you in detail one time. And I didn't go in there to offend them. I just had the opportunity to speak on a different subject. We were talking, and so then the question and answer time came. And so there's 800 people in this room, and they're asking questions. And they're also asking questions. We're in the modern era. They're all, you know, several are holding up phones, and I'm recording, I know. And uh, one of the guys said, Jim, we know who you are. I said, well, that's great. Being funny that I am, I said, I'm glad somebody does. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, we know who you are. Why don't you tell us what you do for a living? And I had to tell him, I'm just a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's not what they wanted to hear. By the way, they didn't ask him, but they didn't ask him back. Mm -hmm. That's okay. That's okay. But I don't know if I've ever felt that kind of pressure. But I have felt the pressure when you're sharing with somebody about Christ or you're sharing with somebody about the salvation experience and they don't want to say yes because they want to debate you and talk about so many other things. Because they're scared of what the gospel says. The Bible tells us very clearly, very plainly, God said, unless you take care of that thing, I'm not going to be with you. When we can abort a baby, a woman is carried, I know there's challenges and I understand the situation, but she's carried a baby nine months, she's on the way to the hospital to deliver the child and decides and changes her mind that she doesn't want the baby anymore. Your vice president said that's legal and that's okay. We are debating all across the country whether or not we should take our old people when they reach a certain age or certain viability, we need to allow them to go ahead and, and die. We need to kill them. It's called euthanasia. We are allowing uh, the way that we solve drug problems is to make them legal. So if they're legal, then that's not drug abuse, right? Isn't that where we are? Crazy. And our language is changing so much, it's just really hard to keep up with. I could go on and on and on and on. Marriage. We're told that it really is not so important anymore. It doesn't matter. You can date whoever you want anytime you want. This is our culture. This is our culture. And we can't teach, as I would might say in the southern, in the southern old-fashioned way, read and write and arithmetic, because we have to teach so many other things. We as a country don't even know which bathroom to use because we're so confused. That's right. Duh. <laughs> and I was reading in the newspaper just this morning a guy saying that the Arkansas legislature was so confused because. They're wasting their time trying to figure out whether or not to allow boys to compete as girls against girls' athletics. Yeah. This is where we are. And we look and say, God bless us. I can say on the authority of Scripture, no, He won't. Amen. He won't. And so I'm passionate about trying to figure out what I can do to light this fire that takes us to a different direction. I'm a little bit longer than I normally am, but that's okay. You can handle it. I heard it right. Amen. 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 Right. <laughs> no, thank you. No great theological revival has ever started in a big church. It's never started at a denominational meeting. Revivals in our history that we record always begin with a small group of people. Who decide to get serious with God. Amen. It's good. And when they get together and get serious with God, God does something extraordinary. Amen. Let me tell you, I really believe it with everything that I am standing in front of you, that God's going to do something incredible here. 
Why not? Why not here? Well, Brother Jim, you don't know us. You're right, I don't. But that's okay. I know God. Amen. Well, you don't know what some of our past is. That's okay. Every church has a past. You don't know. You don't know. You don't know. You don't know. I don't really care. I just care whether or not that I'm right with God. I care whether or not you're right with God. And then as a collective body, we find ourselves passionately in love with Jesus. And we decide that something special is going to happen here. We are only limited by our lack of faith. Amen. Nothing is holding us back. There is no money problem. There's numbers. All of those things don't matter. It's whether or not we want God to do something great. And I want to tell you, I do I want to watch him. I need it in my own heart. I need it in my own life. I need God to do something. Don't you? Okay, right. So as you think of this this week, as we deal with Joshua, get rid of the sin in your life as I will. Ask for forgiveness as I will. Claim forgiveness as the New Testament teaches us. If you confess it, I will forgive it. And then pray for our families. And guys, let's ask God to do something incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Would you stand with me with every head bowed and every eye closed for just a few moments? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Please don't look around. You can play through a hymn of invitation. And as she prays, I want you to take the opportunity to cleanse. Just be bold enough and say, Holy Spirit, reveal to me anything that I need to confess. And as she is playing, just confess it. Do you realize if we all confess when we walk out today, we can walk out clean. Clean. Don't you want to be clean? So God, through the Holy Spirit, move in all of our hearts, including my own. And help me, God, to confess what I need to confess. Forgive me for it. As she plays, you talk to God. Are you talking to him? Don't forget to give me your card that has your phone number on it so that I can keep up with you. And uh, uh, so hopefully I'll get that on the way out. Let's pray together and we'll be dismissed. <laughs> Father, thank you. Thank you that you recorded wonderful stories in your scripture. 
Thank you also, Lord, that you record as challenging ones that teach us deep spiritual truths like Joshua 7. God, it's so easier to learn spiritual lessons as we walk through the valley. Our country's in the valley, God. We need your help and your guidance to get out of it. There might be families here that are struggling. There might be people here. Wrap your arms around them this day. That they might know your love. And they might know your forgiveness. God, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Thank you.